Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we are going to have some fun with Seth. And this is not applicable to anyone's job and is not something that you should do or even try. But it's a way to understand how everything is built up. So let's switch over to my screen here. Here we have a Ceph cluster. It's a newly created single node Ceph cluster with only one uh, pool in it. So nothing pretty much. Uh, I've deleted the OSD so there's no data on this OSD. So here I want to create a new pool. So I want to create an RBD pool. And the reason why I'm using RBD at the moment is because that is a very simplistic um, pool to handle and the most uh, simplistic in how it's actually saving and storing its data. So I want to look into, could I some way take data from one cluster in object uh, storage, the actual background Rados object storage and move them over to a new cluster? That's the question. And I actually were able to do it with a bunch of fiddling. So it's not really something that you should do. Um, and there is a lot of different things stored in different registries and in different places. So it's a little bit hard to actually do real changes and add data to a Ceph cluster. But I think I understand it more. So if we go into the block storage here in images, I can create a new image here. I call it disk one. In my RBD pool, I give it four gigabytes of disk. So there the new disk is now. It's journal mirroring. So the interface is a little bit different from what I remember, but pretty much the same. We have a disk here and it's empty. There is nothing in this disk now. So I want to move a bunch of objects from an old service where there is data into this one. So that's the, the challenge here. So if we switch over to our system here, I can actually run a command to get the data down. And I built this little Java script here, or Java service, Java Rados, where I can read data with the admin user using the Ceph configuration of this pool. And then I read the RDB pool and put that into the directory RBD pool. And I might already have a directory called RBD pool. So let's remove that directory first off here. And so I don't have it, um, have all data there. So let's run this command now. And we will get a bunch of objects down, download all of those. So let's go into the RBD pool here. And here we can see that we have an RBD directory, which is nothing. We have a header for this FA6B668 uh, and so on. We have a disk one. Uh, we have an RBD info. And we also have an RBD object map. But there is no data in this, so there is not much in it. If you go to the RBD pool old, so this is something that I took from an old cluster. Here you can see that you have a bunch of these RBD data objects where you actually have some data. So all of these are stored as objects in the um, object storage. And we can even go one uh, piece further here and you system control stop our Ceph OSD and, and our OSD is number zero. And then we can use the object, uh, Ceph object store tool and run a fuse to mount the specific OSD disk to a specific mount point. And what we are mounting now is not the actual objects because those are stored at specific points in on the actual hardware. So those are really hard to actually reach, but we can mount the database pretty much and go through and look into that. And now I actually need to have a second 
um, command prompt here to actually go in and look at this. So if we go into disk one here, we can see that we have a bunch of these. Um, so these are, I would guess, uh, placement groups. So 7.1 uh, B head is one placement group. So in these different directories here, we can find data from different placement groups. So if we go into a head here, we can see that we have directories like all uh, page group metadata and also hashes. And in the PG metadata is probably empty here because we don't really have any data on this one. Um, so uh, yeah, so we can see that we have a bunch of things here. If we go on this disk, uh, look for the specific ID that we had uh, up here uh, in our other directory here. So we had this ID FA. So take that and put that into a script I have here. So if we go back to the other screen here and put in a grep command that where we look for this specific one, we can find it as a binary match in a bunch of different files here. So we can find it in some attributes, we find it in an object prefix here, a bunch of other binary uh, map files, OMAP files, and we also find it in this data head here and also in this name disk. So if we take, for instance, this path here and cat that, we can see that we have this ID, only that ID in this name disk file. So in order to change that ID, we would be required to change them all over this database, which would be really hard uh, or tedious. Um, and if you do something wrong because it's saved in bits, you get an error, pretty much. <laughs> you can destroy the, to the full disk and get nothing out of it. So I've tried it a bunch of time. I have replaced the bytes in these different uh, database locations in order to have the new um, hash pretty much there. But I wasn't really able to do that correctly and get the data over. So I went over to a different technique. So if we go back to this one and remove the mount there. And we are back and it's a totally different day today. And I weren't able really to get this to work in the other video. So I'm gonna give it a new try today and see if I can get this up and running. So first off, if we look at the actual uh, Ceph cluster here, we see that we have no pool or anything. I will create everything from scratch and hopefully that will work better. I've tried a bunch of different things, um, but I really want to show off how to move data from one cluster to the other. So I will create an RBD pool here and then I will initialize that pool. So I have that in this Ceph cluster. Uh, I will create a disk and disk, disk one it has a size of uh, one uh, four gigabytes image feature of layering and it will be on port 30 or uh, IP 34 and also using the client admin keyring and the RBD pool. Uh, next up we will mount this disk with map disk name of the user IP address and then the keyring and RBD pool. So I mapped it again and it has been mapped a bunch of times now. And then I can go in and actually uh, make efforts on this disk. So this is the RBD pool disk one. And we will create a new block storage there. If we do amount of this block storage, uh, RBD, RBD pool disk one to mount and check that mount. We have no data in that. So now we can unmount that again. So we don't have it mounted. What I want to do now is read the actual data of this pool. And I have built this command. We can look at the code a little bit later here. So Java Rados is the command. I will read with the username user admin 
from the Ceph config uh, rbd pool and then put it in the directory rbd pool. If I do that, I will get a bunch of files here. If we look at the rbd pool here, I have an ID. I'll take this ID and copy over to one uh, to, to a bunch of commands that I have here that I will run later on. So I will set that ID there. Uh, what we want to do next is read the old data from the old machine. So if we copy in this again, the reader, and go here, and then I have an old directory, and I have the configuration file here for the old Ceph cluster. So Ceph single, yeah, I need to change directory, of course. Uh, so read to old, and then I have a configuration file here for Ceph single which is the other cluster the old cluster so if i read that pool there it takes a little bit more time because it's a larger pool so if i go in for rbd pool here and look i have a bunch of data files here and they are a bit sizable and have this specific id if i go into the rbd pool again and check here you see that i have an id and much less data so what i want to do is copy these data files into this <laughs> pool. Uh, so I will create a new directory here, rbd pool new, and go into that directory. And what I want to do now is copy the files over from the old directory. And I have a bunch of these copy commands here that I will just copy paste in. So this is pretty much copy from the old directory with the old ID. Uh, to a new uh, data, uh, new file with a new ID. So if I run all those copy commands, we see here that I have the data files with the same sizes, but with a new ID. Uh, so if we go down here again to the root folder, I can run my command to write this data back to the pool. And to write it back, I again, so there, so here we have the Java, Java Rados, write admin, the Ceph configuration file to the RBD pool and new data. So if I run that, it will write the data back into that pool. Uh, if I go over here, we can again see that we have this pool. It currently have about two megabytes in it. It takes a little while and it will fill up with more data there. So we actually have the full uh, data it's about 50 megabytes I believe so now it has written all that data again we can go back here a bunch of commands and mount that pool again uh, that we had here the rbd pool disk one to mount if we look at that directory we see that we have objects tar gzip if I create the directory, let's call it T, and then tar mount objects tar. We see here that I can untar this data. So this data is actually written to the pool with these radius objects. So I've taken a pool, an old pool, read all the data from that pool, and then written it back to this pool. And it's very finicky, it's really hard to get working. It depends on a bunch of different things. You need to have the right ID and changing that up in the database is a big hassle. So I don't recommend you to actually doing this. This is just something that I did to have fun and see that as a proof of concept. Can I move data from one cluster to another by just reading the data pure and writing it back and I can do that. So there is a possibility to build something where you read data from one pool in one cluster and write it to another pool in another cluster. But I don't think that that is the best backup strategy. So now back to the original uh, video. But we can talk a little bit about this program that I wrote here. So we have this uh, Sephiroth's program that I wrote, and it's this what I run Java. Um, what do you call it? Java Rados. I run this program. 
So here I can take a bunch of input data up here. And if I do a read, I add, call this read function. I can do a write and I call this write function. I can do a rocks read, so I read a rocks and database. Then I have this here. I can read some info, and this was something I tried. And this is fix object. I can actually fix an object that has these binary um, IDs in it. So I tried to figure that one out. Um, not the right solution. So the right is pretty much create a Rados object here for the cluster. Then I take a file here and read the cluster uh, configuration. Uh, then I connect, connect to the cluster and I create a pool connection here, an IO context create gets a pool. I get some stats about the pool and then I get the file directory that I want to write. I go through each of these listed files, get all the bytes for those files and then do an IO write full for the file name. So this is the actual object name that I want to write, the file content and the file content length, and then I destroy this cluster IO. If I go into the read, it's very similar. It has a little bit more code. A connect and everything up here is very similar. I read out all the snaps, and this is debug information to see if I have any snapshots. Um, then I list all the objects here, so I have strings, uh, string IDs of those. I create a byte array here with 65,536 uh, 65, bytes in it. I create a directory for whatever I want to, that, this path I want to write to. And then I get this Rados info and write out a bunch of information about that Rados object. And then I create an output file with the same name as the object name and then create an output stream. And here I do pretty much an IO read of the buffer site in bytes, and then write those bytes back, and then change up the offset and do another write until I don't have any red bytes anymore. And then I close the output stream, I close the, this uh, context, and I handle some exceptions here. And here you can see something that we can read some attributes, for instance, in this info call here. And the rocks DB. So this was something that I looked into because there is a rocks DB that stores the information on where the objects on the disk for the blue store is stored. And it's also used in the monitor to store data, configuration data and so on. I looked into it and the configuration data is actually only stored as changes. So if you change one value that is other than default, that will be set in this database. So it doesn't have all the values in it, only the changes from the default value, which is interesting. Um, but the database is pretty much creating a database options and this is used in order to create a connection. We also have another kind of options that we use for these uh, families. Uh, so we have column families, and these are pretty much buckets uh, where you put objects into, and uh, you can create a bunch of these descriptors to get different information out. I haven't really figured out this data format uh, uh, yet. It's something created by Facebook of all, play of all people. Um, and it's a little bit hard to understand, but you can open this. And if you open a database that has other than the default, which is always open of these column families, if you open one that has more than that, you need to supply these column families descriptors and you will get handlers back for all the different buckets where you can put objects into. And here I print out the default one, so I know what the name of that is. And then I can go through for each of these uh, column family handles, I can create an iterator all over, over all the objects, seek to the first object, and then check if, uh, do this until it's not valid anymore, and then I do a next, so I loop through them. I fetch the ID key, and the key is actually a binary or a, b a bunch of bytes. So I create a string of those, I print out that string, I check if this is the object prefix, 
So I want to look at that specific object, uh, if it contains that, and then I get that specific key so I can actually fetch the data down here. So if I have a key, I will take the DB and get that specific key, then I get some bytes that I can print out and get the actual value. And then I close the DB down here. Um, this get the family description is a bunch of uh, functions here that I pretty much copy pasted from someone else. So it will list all the column families of this rocks and DB and then add them uh, to the existing families here. Um, and then you have the default as well that you need to add. So then you get all the families and down here it goes through all those bytes and then creates descriptors from those bytes with family options and the family options are just returned as new family options that nothing specific there and then we will have these family column descriptors so we will take the bytes that we get up here and then create objects of them down here so this is all the code that i wrote myself I have tried the Ceph object store tool to fuse. I have tried the Ceph blue store tool where you also have a bunch of different interesting functions. The Ceph object store tool had actually repair functions. It had read functions so you can read a specific pool data or object data and so on. So there is a bunch of interesting commands here that you can use very low level on your system but i would say that it's not really worth it because <laughs> yeah the system itself is self-healing so if you don't have a very specific problem then you don't really need to go down to this level to try to fix something and um, every byte that you change can actually broke break your system so if you're in, on this level and handling things, you are on your own. It's very dangerous for your data safety. So that's why I say this is not something you should do. This is not a backup strategy or anything like that. I just wanted to play around with it a little bit to understand a little bit more on how Ceph is storing its data. I hope that you found this video interesting. I hope that you learned something today. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I really hope to see you in the next video.